So let me uh, introduce myself. I'm Kevin Vulcan. I'm a professor of psychology at Cal State Channel Islands, just down the road. Um, as our president likes to say, it is uh, your university. So um, anything I'm saying in this class, if, if you know the stuff I'm saying is interesting to you, and you feel like you want to come out and sit in a lecture sometime that I'm giving, you know, you're always welcome to come out to my classes and sit in a lecture. We actually get people from the community, we like to get people from the community to come and, and be part of the university. And it really is, you know, your university too. It's not just us off in some ivory tower out there in the fields. It's, you know, it's something hopefully for everybody. Okay. So I've been teaching there uh, since, the, since the university opened. And uh, I've got to say it's about seven or eight years ago, I um, had this idea that we should be teaching a class on uh, Nazi Germany and the, the uh, Holocaust. And so I talked to a colleague of mine, Dr. Reiner Bushman, who's a professor in the history department, and he is of uh, German origin. And, uh, him and, and he very reluctantly, um, I kind of twisted his arm, and he very reluctantly agreed to teach the class with me. He, he, um, he had a lot of trepidation about you know, being German, about going into, into his own past. And, um, and after I twisted his arm, kind of you know, behind his back and up here, uh, you know, I got him to do it. And we've been doing that class ever since. And it's one of the uh, largest classes at the, on the Channel Island campus. And I would like to say, and I, I think this is true, it, it's one of the most popular. I'd say every semester that we get over 100 students in the class. We have a very large lecture hall that we teach it in. We have a lot of people. I've had students who graduate um, tell me that this is one of the most um, impactful classes they've had. I don't know if that's true for everybody, but I know a couple people have told me that. Um, I think it is the only class on the campus where we re you really learn in depth about Nazi Germany and the, and the Holocaust. So, I, and again, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I, that's my understanding. I think we're, uh, we're, we're it. So, um, what I'm going to do today is I'm taking a, a lecture that I normally give in that class and um, kind of condensing it down for you guys. And this is a, a lecture I give um, when talking about, people always ask why, why do, uh, you know, why did the Nazis do such horrible things? How could people be so crazy? that they would just, first of all, follow a nut like Hitler, and then follow another nut like Himmler. You know, two guys who are, you know, let's put it in you know, clinical, technical psychology terms, you know, who were, you know, you know, bat crap crazy, right? I mean, they were, they were really out there, you know, not, normal people don't act that way, right? Killing thousands of people, wanting to get rid of a whole group of people just because of their background, et cetera. So, but why would a whole nation of people follow these guys? This is a question, everybody's been asking this, everybody's interested in this. And we can elaborate the question into uh, maybe a more succinct form and ask, why would ordinary people do such evil things? Why would ordinary people do such evil things? And you know, if you think the vast majority of Germans, you know, were, 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 were pretty ordinary people. You know, there wasn't anything, you know, especially, you know, weird about them. They didn't have an extra arm and they weren't sprouting devil horns outside of their head or anything. They were, they were just people. And yet, you know, many of them, you know, did really, you know, terrible things to other people. And so why, what would, what would inspire these people? What would cause them to do this? And this is a central theme that runs through um, the class that we teach. And so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about, um, very briefly, about uh, the Nazi leaders. And, these, and, and give you a sense of like, okay, here are, the, here are the people who may have some kind of overt psychopathology. And then I'm going to go through them very quickly, there's not a lot of time and then talk a little bit about what about these ordinary people. And I'm going to reference a book by Christopher Browning called Ordinary Men. And this, this is a book that was written by the historian Christopher Browning about um, basically an ordinary group of, of Germans who get co-opted into um, joining what are called the Einsatz group and the special action forces who follow behind the, the main troops and are responsible for uh, eliminating um, unwanted individuals. And we'll talk a little bit about what they did. And, and so some of this is going to be a little graphic. Um, you know, hopefully it's not going to be anything that's, um, that, that you guys haven't heard before. Um, but just to, for forewarning, you know, it's a little bit not a pleasant subject. Okay? And then after that, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what 
the, the science of psychology has to say about this. You know, and, and again, this was a question, especially after World War II, that you know, really engaged at least uh, you know, two psychologists. One uh, very, very directly and very uh, purposely, and the other one sort of um, got into it a little indirectly. And I want to talk to you about two very famous psychological experiments, and, uh, and then probably we'll be out of time, and then we can maybe have a little discussion about stuff. Okay, does that sound, sound good? Great. Okay. Um, so again, you know, the, the focus on this talk is going to be on Nazis. Okay. Uh, I could sit here all night. We could go until you know the sun comes up in the morning, and I could continue to talk to you about Nazis. It's an area that I'm interested in. I'm interested in people who are who have um, uh, kind of very strange psychopathologies. Uh, the Nazis are kind of a many of them are a good case history in this. Um, how people with such pathologies could um, start to co-opt an entire population of people. And again, you know, I'll leave it to you guys to draw your own conclusions about the political climate today. Um, I, I won't be going into that. I mean, we could talk about what's going on in America. We could certainly talk about what's going on in Russia right now and draw lots of parallels. Again, we would be here for in the next five days just having a discussion, a very interesting discussion, but um, probably we don't have time to go into that tonight. And again, you know, I would encourage you guys who are interested, come by when we do the class and, you know, sit in on the, on the regular lectures and we'll get into some of that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about pathological leaders. Let's talk about the people we know do crazy stuff. Okay? And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because, again, we don't have a lot of time. In the regular lecture, I will go into a lot more detail. I like to walk around. Um, and I have my handy dandy laser pointer with a green laser. No, that's my car. Keys. Wait a minute. I'll get with it. And yes, I have been um, accused of being the absent minded professor, and it's absolutely 100% true. But I do have now a fancy green laser pointer. So here are two individuals that um, are known uh, Nazi leaders, uh, pathological, I consider them to be pathological characters. Um, and we know something about. Uh, the pathology of leaders. Okay, this is something that's been studied quite a lot, more than the pathology, maybe perhaps of ordinary people. We know something about the pathology. We know something about the pathology of leaders. Both extreme pathology, such as these guys would manifest, and we know just sort of about the mild pathology. Anybody ever here had a, had a kind of crazy boss or a boss who was full of himself and, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, made everybody, you know, dance around them and do, you know, crazy irrational stuff? Anybody like that? Anybody had a boss like that? Uh, you know, so we've, we've all been there, right? Um, these, these are crazy bosses at another level. Okay? This is Heinrich Himmler, who was a uh, chicken farmer turned Nazi, became at the end of the war, the end of the war, the second most powerful man, probably the second most powerful man in Germany after Hitler. Okay? Um, and this is his adjunct, 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 I think I put it up, tongue tied. Uh, his right-hand man, um, uh, Reiner Heydrich, okay? and um, this this was a guy who was um, responsible for actually um, putting the, in, in motion the machinery to actually get the Holocaust to happen. And if you're interested, there's a really excellent HBO movie called The Conspiracy, and I highly recommend if you're interested in stuff that you watch that movie. We had time tonight. I would show you that first, and we, we have this lecture, and we get a better, better sense of all the leadership pathology among the Nazis. And there was lots of different kinds at different levels. And Heydrich was one of the top guys, uh, very dictatorial, very um, very focused, very, very intelligent guy, and um, you know, put a lot of that machinery into work. We're not going to talk much about him um, tonight. He was uh, assassinated by uh, partisans, I believe in Czechoslovakia, who were uh, dropped in by the British, um, and then they ambushed his car, and they shot him up, and then he got away, and he died a few days later in the hospital, and of course then the Nazis rounded up vast amounts of people and you know, executed him in revenge for his killing. And of course Himmler, as you might know, was uh, um, at the end of the war, was trying to make deals with the Allies, thinking that you know, they make deals with the Allies because they don't like the, we don't like the Russians. And um, Hitler found out about it and sort of excommunicated him. And then Hitler, after Hitler died, he tried to ingratiate himself to the 
the, the, the Nazis that were left who were trying to negotiate the peace, Admiral Donuts and these guys, who wanted nothing to do with it. He ended up putting on, um, you know, plain uh, uh, lower level army clothes and trying to sneak in. The Allies caught him. They figured out who he was. He had a sign in capsule, fit down, and that was the with him. So unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to study him further. There's a very good book out now by his grand niece, Catherine, um, Catherine Himmler. I highly recommend this book. It's fascinating. Glimpse into the Himmler's family life. And she goes back and interviews her relatives and um, finds out all this very interesting information about them. And um, again, if we had time, I'd be going into some of that. So clearly, um, one thing about these guys, there's a good level of narcissism. You guys know what narcissism is? You know, the world revolves around me, right? And um, lack of empathy for other people, um, using other people to, 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 for their own gain, things like this. These guys both had a good, a good uh, dollop of that along with other stuff. Okay. And again, a lot of this, in psychology, we, we tend to assume that a lot of this pathology has to do with these people's early upbringing. It's not always the case, but usually we can see something in the early family life that would kind of tend to make us think that, you know, something is not quite right. Okay? This is debatable, you know, and now that I'm studying more about Himmler's family, I'm getting this stuff, you know, he's turning out to look a lot more normal, quote, in quotes, than I had previously thought about. So this is an area I'm constantly sort of looking at and wondering about. But in general, psychologists, you know, we like to, especially clinical psychologists, we like to look at the early upbringing. Um, Himmler, we really think of as a schizoid personality. Schizoid personality is a person who really represses a lot of emotions, doesn't show anything on the outside, um, has a very difficult time with relationships with other people. And I think, um, I have something here. Um, his reaction, uh, reaction uh, to emotions in the unconscious are really rather state of masochistic. Means he, um, you know, there's a tendency to want to hurt other people. There's also at some point a tendency to feel like a victim. And Himmler had both those things. Um, any compassion he shows is what we call a reaction formation. This is, um, you know, it's like an unconscious reaction to wanting to hurt people, and so you back away from that, and what you show outside is, oh, I'm really compassionate, right? Oh, I'm really compassionate, oh, I really want to help you, but underneath, you know, I really want to kill you, right? And so that's, Himmler had some of that, um, identifies with suffering, uh, and this could be a lack of love and nourishment. In his case, it could be related to his father, be related to his mother, he never talks about his mother, which always makes you think there's something going on there. Um, his relationship with women are odd, um, women are either, you know, on a pedestal, these beautiful, pure creatures, or they're sexually depraved, um, you know, breeding machines. And of course, Himmler establishes a human breeding program, a leave born program in Germany to breed Aryan children to the right. And, um, you know, this is a good example of this kind of thing. You know, you've got these idealized women, you know, these SS Aryan officers' wives, and you've got basically anybody who sort of looks Aryan and bring in. And, and this is a program of reading, which is a very interesting thing in and of itself. Uh, compensatory narcissism, he, he walks around being, you know, acting moral, morally and ethically superior. Um, eroticizes aggression and hostility. Um, interest in farming and animals, erotic displacement on the animals. That's the only way he can, he can have some closeness to anything that's actually really living or warm or, you know, is, is with animals, not with people. And obsession with work helps him to control it in his body. I don't know anybody like that. <laughs> Hopefully nobody's no over the top with that. Um, so Himmler deflated all those things. Um, deals with people as stereotypes rather than real people. And to gain relief from his inner frustration, anger, guilt, and say to masochistic feelings, he projects these out onto some other, right? Some other got all these things boiling up inside unconsciously, this anger, guilt, you know, aggression, hostility, and you can't deal with it. So you project it out onto some other, you find some other suitable scapegoat 
right, symbolically or physically or both. And of course, for Himmler and many of the Nazis, this, these things are projected out onto the Jews. So I got all this bad stuff inside of me, I can't tolerate it. So to deal with it, I project it out onto some other group. Right? And the Jews become a convenient scapegoat for many of the Nazis. Why are they convenient? They're convenient because Europe at this time, especially Germany and Austria, have a very strong history of anti-Semitism. There's a lot of anti-Semitism before World War II. I mean, and this goes back quite a long way into European history. And so by the time the Nazis come around, this is perhaps built up you know, to such a degree that, they, that, that anytime there's all this stuff going on internally for these leaders, they can project it out onto you know, a group. This is a perfect group. It's ready-made for them. And it's out there, and so they project it out on the Jews. And so the Jews take on all the characteristics of the bad characteristics of these guys' internal life, if that makes any sense. Okay? So you have this group projected out on them. You know, there weren't that many Jews in Germany at, at this time. Um, you know, they're convenient. You know, to, to pick on. They're you know they're easy to pick on. Uh, German Jews are highly assimilated into into German life. Most of them feel like they're Germans. They just happen to be Jewish. You know, it's like you know, Jewish people now are part of our society. We don't think of them as non-Americans. They're Jewish, but they're not Americans. They're, they're Americans who happen to be of the Jewish faith, right? The, the German Jews are shocked to be suddenly split apart from you know, being German. You know, it, it's really shocking. And this also happens in France, also where Jews are, are highly assimilated into, the, into society. And later on, when, when the Germans invade Poland, and then later on they go into the east, into Russia, into the Ukraine, um, Lithuania, and these places, they, they, they run into Jews who are less assimilated. And in a way, for the German leadership, this is, this is a good thing, because these less assimilated Jews make a much easier target. They look different, they act different, they have a different, you know, you know, different kind of languages, they, you know, they're, they're, really, they're really other, right? And so it becomes even easier to project all these negative things onto them. And I love this picture. This is Himmler doing a parade ground of uh, prisoners at a concentration camp. I assume this guy is a Russian prisoner. And you can't see because the slide's a little blurry, but the look of disdain and moral superiority in his face is almost tangible. And um, in 1943, October 6th, Himmler gives a speech at Posen where he outlines the program, um, you know, the culmination of, if you want, his psychopathology. And, he, and this is a speech that actually was recorded, secretly recorded, I don't know, secretly was recorded. It was not ever supposed to get out. It was, it was a speech to the inner circle of the SS. And in it, he, he lines out here um, that, you know, that, that the Jewish people need to be exterminated perfectly clear it's part of our plans, eliminating Jews, exterminating them, a small matter, and how basically it's, not, it's difficult to do, but we gotta get rid of all of them, including the children, because we don't want them to grow up to revenge their parents. So we gotta get rid of all of them. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's our duty, and we must do it, right? And so, you know, clearly this is the, this is the, uh, the, this is the agenda here. This is the pathological. And of course, you guys know um, the result of this in the end is that um, all the modern resources, uh, resources, you know, trains, planes, buses, automobiles, technology, modern technology, some of the best minds in chemistry, in metallurgy, in um, design, you know, their, their energies are turned toward basically creating death camps. And, and again, why would people do this? You know, you're an architect. Why would you agree to design a death camp? And yet we know there were architects who designed the death camp. If you were a chemist, why would you agree to, you know, to you know, look into you know, substances, poisons, you know, for, for, for murdering you know, millions of human beings? Yet we know that, that there were German citizens who did this. Okay? That, that, you know, these death camps, didn't exist in isolation. There, there were, you know, train engineers who, you know, had to, you know, pilot the locomotives. I don't know what you say, locomotive, drive the train, you know, ride the train. So driving the train 
to the camps and they're pulling people and there, there are there are railroad clerks who are issuing you know thousands upon thousands of one-way tickets of people who never come back you know these people had to know these are ordinary people how it, in, but yet to some degree you know they're complicit in this in this craziness this, this, this mass murdering craziness right now after the war you know, a lot of Germans oh I didn't know what's going on but a lot of them did know a lot of them, you know, had to make this happen, right? Many people worked in uh, production facilities, manufacturing facilities that used slave labor. This, this came out later, right? The slave labor stuff. You know, well, somebody, you know, and some of these guys were, you know, after the war, you guys, you know, um, a lot of the German scientists and things like this were, you know, picked up by the Americans and basically told, you know, come and work for us. You know, we like what you're doing with those rockets or, you know, this kind of munition things or this kind of weapon design come and work for us, you know, and, and it was glossed over that they used slave labor during the time of the war. Slave labor meaning people chained to their machines and driven, you know, 20 hours a day until they died at their post from, from, from overwork and starvation. Right? So by slave labor, I mean eliminationist slave labor, right? And so a lot of the people that, you know, were thought to be useful you know, to America after the war, war should be given, you know, sanctuary here and all that stuff was glossed over, but it certainly happened. And by the way, the Germans weren't the only ones that, that happened to the Japanese also. This happened. There was a very famous unit in Japan, Unit 731, which, is in, which, is, which was in Manchuria, which was um, the center of Japan's biological warfare research that used a lot of human experimentation. And not a lot of people know about it because unlike the Nazis, you know, where we have survivors from medical experiments done in the camps, in Japanese um, uh, 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 theater of war where they were doing this stuff, the survivor rate was about zero. So if they decided to experiment on you, you didn't survive. And they experimented with things like bubonic plague and typhus and figuring out ways they could spread this and kill people and they used people for uh, live human beings for experimentation. They did vivisection, if you know what this vivisection is. It's like dissection, only viva means alive, so it was live dissection on people. And they did a lot of really horrendous stuff to people. And so again, it wasn't just the Nazis. And they had this also in Japan and um, other places. After the war, all the people involved in the biological warfare were um, just you know, asked to work for the Americans and uh, they were never brought up on war, on war crime charges. This is, you could think that's good or bad. I mean, you know, we felt like we needed biological warfare because the Russians were, you know, right over there and the Cold War was starting. You'll make your own decision about what you think that was good or bad for. Um, some of the Nazi leaders, some of the middle managers, if you will, um, wrote memoirs. This is by Rudolf Huss, who uh, was uh, the commandant at Auschwitz. And he wrote this book, uh, his memoirs. He wrote this while he was waiting for his, uh, during his trial, and he held that after in the Nuremberg trials he was held. He was in jail for about two years and wrote this memoir. And in it, he really kind of comes clean. He talks about what he did. He talks about how the camps were run, all the mechanics of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, obviously he's trying to make himself look good in this, but he also really spills the beans and talks a lot about how the camps ran and, um, you know, the mechanics of everything. And, you know, talks about how many people were pro killed in the camps, um, how they processed the bodies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, at the end of the, once he was convicted, he was, he was uh, I believe he was hung, he was executed. There he is, Get ready. There he is. Um, now, again, he's a guy who's very interesting because, again, we looked at this thing I told you before about the leadership and about, like, we we're always, ex you know, looking into their childhood to see what, what screwed him up, right? And he's an interesting guy because his childhood didn't look too screwy. He kind of had a pretty normal childhood. He was treated pretty well. He had pretty nice parents, especially by standards of the time in Germany. His father didn't beat him. Um, and yet he turned out to be this horrible, you know, mass murdering, you know, bureaucrat. And so again, you know, we take that, you know, psychological supposition about the family upbringing, we gotta really take that a little bit of a grain salt. Or, or, or I'd like to say, you know, we really need more specific data about things. Because 
psychology. It's a general supposition that psychologists have. In most cases, it's really true. If we go down to the county jail here, and I pull at random, you know, five prisoners who are in there accused of violent crimes, I can almost guarantee you 100% we're gonna find some real problems in their early family life. There are some real issues with their parents beating them or they're drunk or, you know, almost guarantee it. But again, look at a guy like this, murdered millions of people, family life was yeah, not too bad. So a little question mark there, you know, keep that in there. Okay. Uh, by the way, this is him getting his uh, just desserts. Getting hung there. Uh, I believe this was uh, this picture, the soldier was not supposed to take these pictures and he snuck them anyway. And so that's why we have this picture. Okay, so that's the leadership stuff. That's what I want to talk about the leadership, just to give you a little taste of that. Um, but now, and, and hopefully now you're thinking that, okay, okay, Kevin, you know, now we get a sense of, you know, why these leaders, yeah, they're crazy, weird things. I'm just skimming the surface here on this. But, you know, hopefully you're thinking, yeah, you know, some of these leaders, you know, I could talk a whole lecture on Hitler, just on Hitler, and, you know, crazy, crazy, crazy. What about the ordinary guys? What about just your regular Germans? And I want to point out to this, this book, this is an excellent book, um, highly, highly recommend this, I think, um, well-written, interesting book, by this guy, Christopher Browning, he's a historian, and this is the book he wrote, Ordinary Men, Reserve Police Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland, and here's a picture of these Einsatz group of guys, and they are rounding up Jews, and of course, look at these Jews, these are Eastern European Jews, they are not assimilated into a modern, European culture like Germany and France, it's very different. And of course, then it becomes easier to project otherness onto them. Right? Easier to project all your bad things onto them because they're so different. They're not like me, right? So throw all my bad stuff on them. Um, basically, uh, Operation Barbarossa was the German invasion into Russia. and. Um, and the, the initial operation were, were very quick. Uh, Germans fought a blitzkrieg war, you know, lightning war. They just come in, you know, with overwhelming, you know, uh, uh, technological superiority. They didn't have overwhelming numbers, but they had overwhelming technological superiority. The Russian army was very weak because Stalin, of course, had purged all his generals, all his experienced generals. He killed them all. And so um, initially in the war, the Germans went into, you know, they went into Poland. Poland had been divided up. Um, you know, the, the Germans and the Russians had a treaty over Poland, and Poland was divided up into a German sphere and a Russian sphere. The, the, the Germans attack, they, they go through, they take in the rest of Poland, and they go into uh, Russia, they go into what is now the Ukraine, um, and they make a very quick advance into the east, into the rest of Poland and on into Russia. As the front moves forward toward Russia, there are groups of men that follow behind. There, there are groups of uh, paramilitary, military or paramilitary, usually attached to the SS. And one thing you have to understand at, in the German armed forces was that there were the regular Wehrmacht military. And then there was also a kind of a shadow army made up of the SS, which initially were supposed to be these um, very elite soldiers, and some of them were really quite elite. But by the time that, that, you know, that the Germans get, um, get into Russia, and especially after they bog down in Russia, they are recruiting lots of people from countries that they have subjugated. There are French SS divisions, there are Nordic SS divisions, there were plans for a British SS division, which never really materialized, maybe one or two guys. Um, there were plans for an American one, if they ever you know, invaded America. But there were British, there were, there were French, there were, there were accept, racially acceptable individuals from another, a number of countries. There were even Muslim Waffen-SS, Waffen-SS, uh, you know, war SS. And either, either, there, is, there is even a Muslim division, um, which is very interesting because it actually has ties to um, Yasser Arafat and people like this. It's another whole lecture, it's quite fascinating. Um, but there are lots of non-Germans in the SS, as well as you know, elite German units in the SS. And these guys who did the so-called mopping up operations behind the front were in the charge of the SS. They were, they were, they were under the orders of the SS. By this time, Himmler is in charge of all, all the police in Germany. And so all the police in Germany, including the Gestapo, but even the regular police, are under the authority of the SS. 
And here, uh, General Keitel is the commander, um, issued a supplemental order, and he said, in the theater operations, the Reichsführer SS, this is Himmler, has special assignments from the Fuhrer for the preparation of political administration, and special assignments result from the final and decisive struggle between two opposed political systems. And this is Nazism and communism. Communism is equated to Jewishness. Jews are communists, communists are Jews. They are almost, they are, they are, they are integrated. So when they say two political systems, not only mean communism, they mean, they mean also Jewry, and Jewish people. In the conduct of these assignments, the Reichsführer SS acts independently on in its own authority. So in other words, the SS are going to come up behind us while we're doing stuff. They may do some really bad stuff. I wash my hands of whatever they do. The Wehrmacht is going to have nothing to do with what the SS do. We're just army guys. We go out and do the army. And this is the, the myth of the good German, the good German soldier. He's just the grunt. He's out there just fighting the war, do, following orders, doing what he's told, fighting Russians. You know, he's not committing war crimes. He's just fighting people on the front. And this is the myth. And what we know now is that that is a myth. It's not really true. But there were, there were, there were Wehrmacht people involved in some of the SS operations. Of course, there were SS operations. Uh, people involved in fighting at the front and doing other things. And things were a lot more mixed up than, 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 than we were initially um, wanting to believe. Because we wanted, you know, we wanted the Germans to become our allies, right, get, get the Russians back in the Cold War. So we had these convenient myths that, oh, the German army guys, they were good, and the SS were bad. Not really true. And here's, the, here's another uh, order here. Also, um, if, if the local population decide they want to get rid of a few Jews, just leave them alone, right? And this especially happened in Ukraine. I know we're talking about Ukraine you know, now and being invaded by the Russians. I'm not excusing the invasion of Crimea in any way, shape, or form, but you know, one of the things the Russians, you know, they, you know, partly when the Russians came, when the um, Germans came in, a lot of the Ukrainians welcomed them as liberators because the Russians were not very pleasant, especially under Stalin, were not very pleasant, right? And so when the Germans come and they welcome as liberators, and many of the Ukrainians also were pretty anti-Semitic and were happy you know, to please the Germans to round up a bunch of Jews and beat them to death or, or do whatever. And so if you can get the Ukrainians to do the dirty work, let them do it, right? So this order is basically saying that if they want to do the dirty work, let them do it. Okay. Now, the Einsatzgruppen, these special special action groups were about 3,000 men in all. There were other people who helped them. There were regular SS groups. There were other people. There were some Wehrmacht. They weren't the only ones who did all this stuff. They had help, but they were the, these are the, these are what we think of as the ordinary men. Many of them are ordinary people. They were, they were small, sorry, it's a typo, units of SS and police, about 3,000. They were killing units, and just about everyone they killed was a civilian of some sort. And they did not kill armed uh, people who were resisting them in a war. They killed unarmed civilians. This included uh, women and children, in addition to men. Uh, they killed Jews, who were their primary targets, communists, and uh, commissars, who were the uh, communist political officers who were usually assigned to an area. If they found out you were a commissar, they just took you over and shot you in the spot. They didn't even bother to, you know, wait and take you to the pit later and shoot you with their breath. They just shot you in the spot. Um, uh, Sinta Roma, who were, you know, we, we call them, I think it's somewhat pejorative, we call them gypsies, but Sinta Roma people who also um, rounded up. Any political leaders, um, intellectual, you know, the mayor of the city, anybody who had some power over people, uh, intellectuals, you know, professors, we don't like them. You know, Nazis were not big on intellectuals. They were very anti-intellectual. So, um, professors, intellectuals, intelligentsia. They killed people individually, but also carried out mass executions. And they did this in a number of ways. Uh, one way is to line people up against the wall and shoot them. And you'll notice here, you have, you have this is the people doing the mass killing. These guys are Wehrmacht. They're army, you see, they're in army uniforms. They're, they're not the Einsatz group, they're army guys. So it wasn't just the Einsatz group, mostly the Einsatz group. They had help from the army people, who were supposed to be, you know, officially neutral and not get involved, but they had some help. Okay. Most of the Jewish victims were living in urban settings, which were easily reached by the Wehrmacht. Um, 
you know, Jew, you know, people always ask, why the Jews, why didn't they resist? There was some resistance, especially in the East. Um, if you see the movie with Daniel Craig, you know, James Bond, uh, Defiance, highly recommend it. It's, it's pretty graphic, it's pretty violent, um, but it's, it, it, it is a good depiction of some of the resistance that went on in the East. Uh, but most of these Jewish people were urban. You know, they, they, they were living in an urban place. Um, you know, the, the Germans came in very quickly. And they didn't have time. They were they were they were taken by surprise. They didn't have any, you know, to resist. We live in the city. We're modern, you know. And so they, this is this is one of the reasons why it was so easy for them to be. Um, now, of course, as they get further into the east, they get more rural people. They start going into villages and things like that. But it wasn't it wasn't. I mean, people think, oh, we knew the Germans were coming. We should have just escaped. They they they, they didn't have time to escape. Now, here is a, um, a map of where these killings took place. Okay. And again, this is Germany. This is uh, the general government. This is uh, you know, German half of Poland. And as they go into here, in the Soviet Union, here's the place to go. Some of these are very famous places. You guys may have heard of Bobby Yar, which is on your Kia, which we see these mass graves and things like this. Um, here they go. By the way, just a little quiz for you guys. What's this country? What? Crimea. This is where all the problem is right now. Uh, what's over here? Oil fields. Germans wanted this stuff. They didn't get it. They really wanted it. They didn't get it. This is maybe one of the reasons why they lost the war. Okay. But here, there's a lot of places where these killings uh, went on. There were five stages to the killings. I mean, you know, as the, for, the, the, the as the front is in, you know, the places are invaded, as the front moves forward, as soon as the front's forward, um, the Einsatz would come up, immediately followed immediately by the roundup of Jews and other victims. They're round up, they're marched to the outskirts of the city. Um, there are pits that they either dig or are already dug, and their people are shot in the pits. Bodies are buried in mass graves. The ditches are filled with bodies. Um, and then layer by layer. So when people line up in the grave, they get shot, usually in the neck. Somebody can walk along and shoot them in the neck. They fall in, they put a, a, a layer of lime over, they send the next group in, you know, shoot them in the neck, they fall in, it's just like a production line. And in some cases, they line people up in front of the grave, take machine guns, just mow them all down. We know this because there's a couple people where that happened who, you know, fell in the grave, they were still alive, and later were able to crawl out talk about this later, survived. Not very many, but a few. Um, the residents of the cities, the non-Jewish residents, knew what was happening, but what are they gonna do? If they go try to intervene, then they're gonna get shot too, right? But of course, you know, um, the neutrality always helps the killer. If you don't do anything to kill her, you know, that's, that's a win for the killer. Um, so, there are auxiliaries composed of local natives, especially in places again like Ukraine I mentioned, where, where they were really understaffed. They could get locals who were down with the program with the Nazis and help out, especially because they were very understaffed. Um, collaborators, local collaborators, especially I believe up in here, you get them in Lithuania, um, in some parts of Ukraine you had some of these. Things. At the end of this, 1.2 million Jews are killed with these special actions. So, you know, in the, whole, in the, in the, in the concentration camps, you know, you're talking five to nine million. And the estimates are, they vary quite a bit. But we can take an average and say five to six million. Um, and then, you know, 1.2 were killed here, kind of killed by hand, by shooting somebody. Okay? Um, this is quite a lot. One of the reasons that the concentration camps develop and they, they think the need for them is because this killing is too personal. There's guys doing the killing here and they are, you know, they are, they are, they are having post-traumatic stress from spending the whole day killing people. And the SS noticed this. And they go, this is really hard on our, our men. We need to find a better way, a more mechanical way, a more um, indirect way, a more removed way of killing people. And again, this is, this is, and again, they looked back to the T4 program, which is, it was, it had gone on in Germany where they had killed 
um, mentally ill people and uh, people with physical defects, et cetera, um, mental defects earlier on. And they said, yeah, you know, we had started to use some gas for that, and that seemed to be effective. And so they started using gas. They used gas trucks. I think I have a picture of one later. They would drive these gas trucks up. They'd load them up full of uh, you know, Jewish individuals. And they close the door. They drive around for 20 minutes, and they would pipe the exhaust into the back. And then the people in the back would, um, would uh, be killed from carbon monoxide poisoning. The joke among the SS was that they would go in red and come out pink, right? Because they're red, because they're commies. You know, communists put them in the back, drive them around, deprive them of oxygen with CO2, and then their bodies turn pinkish. And that was the you know, kind of macabre joke. Now, the high-ranking guys, the onset scrutiny guys, the, 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 uh, the officers, um, these guys were also normal guys, but they were, they were sort of upper class, very well educated people. Okay? Um, this is, uh, I believe this is this guy, Ernst Bieberstein, uh, Einsatz Group in C, was a Protestant pastor, a theologian, and a church official. Another guy, Otto Ohlendorf, was commander of Einsatz Group in D, had three university degrees, including a doctorate in law. By the way, many of the uh, high ranking Nazis had law degrees. Again, if you see the movie Conspiracy, they're all sitting around the table, these different guys from different Nazi branches, and they're deciding on the final solution. And at one point, somebody says, how many people here have law degrees? And they all basically all raise their hands, right? So I'm not making any, my wife's a lawyer, so I'm not making any cracks about lawyers. Um, but again, I'll let you draw your own. Okay. Uh, but these guys, a lot of the, um, the commanders, but they were also kind of ordinary men in the sense that they were like, you know, this guy was a pastor, this guy was a, you know, a lawyer, <laughs> you know, highly educated, and yet they're going along with this stuff. Now, there was a reason, these guys may have had a reason for going along with this program, because this was a good way to get promoted. You know, you were part of the Einsatz group, and you show that you really were very zealous, you killed a lot of Jews, and you know, then he gets back to your, your, your you know, the superiors, and like, oh yeah, that's a guy we want to promote. You know, so some of these guys may have done this, you know, sort of like for, you know, show what a good job they're doing, they're really zealous. You know, at one point, Lithuania becomes uh, Juden Fry, right? Jew, Jewish free, free of Jewish people. And the commanders, you know, basically thinking like, you know, this is going to get me provoked, right? And they really show I did a really good job. I got rid of all the Jews, right? So these guys, they may have had some, some um, uh, status or monetary um, um, reasons for wanting to, 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 to do this. And this is a report, this is called the Jaeger Report. And this is, uh, this was captured after the war. The Germans kept a lot of records of things. And so they kept a very meticulous record. You can't see it too clearly because it's, it's you know, a little blurry, but this is, you know, here's a city, who was killed? Jews, 32 of them, right? Here we go, another city, 32 Jews, you know, one, in, one intellectual, a commissar, two commissars. They kept a list of all the people. And so we actually, these lists have, have survived and come down to it. So we know that, and we know we did what? You know, here are 2,500, here's 400, here's 19, here was one. One Jewish guy gets killed in this village on this day, right? On down the list. They kept meticulous lists of all the people they eliminated. This is the gas truck. So this is, again, you know, after the shooting becomes hard on the men, they introduce these gas trucks. And from these gas trucks, they get the idea later on of building the camps, and the camps, they experiment not only with carbon monoxide, but eventually with Cyclone B, which is a pesticide that produces uh, cyanide gas when it's dropped in. And that, of course, as you know, is the, one of the main things they use to kill people in mass in the concentration camps. Now, reserve police battalion made up of middle-aged men who are basically equivalent to policemen or reserve policemen, sheriffs. So some of you guys may know uh, may, may know some police here. You may know people in law enforcement. I have a number of friends, you know, I do karate with a bunch of police. You know, good guys, regular guys, regular family men. Um, you know, nothing uh, weird about them. They're not closet Nazis or anything like that. And this is the same at this time. You know, these guys were mostly middle-aged men. They were lower middle class. They weren't mostly high school educated. Um, uh, many of them had been policemen and were either retired or were, you know, at the you know, the, the later stages of their career. 
and when the war comes along, they're drafted up. They're said, oh, you're, you're, you know, it's like you're in the reserve, right? So yeah, you know, you were retired. We're going to bring you up now. And so they bring them up to, the, and these are the guys who are in the nine sets. And these guys are responsible for um, killing. And here's the picture of them. They, they gather around up Jews. Um, they to interrogate people. And here, here's the picture, the horrific picture. Line people up next to the ditch, and then they would shoot them. And they'd fall in here. And then the next group line them up, shoot them, they'd fall in. And once they finished, they just bury the whole thing and be done with it. Again, this is a picture that's, that was taken by probably a Wehrmacht, a regular army officer who observed this. And this was very common that the Wehrmacht would come and see, hey, what's going on? You know, and they would they'd observe these things. And this guy took a picture. This was ver verboten to take pictures, but you know, they, a lot of these guys would sneak pictures. Some of them would take these pictures and send them back to their families back in Germany. You know, this is somehow how some of this stuff survived, right? And we have a couple pictures you know, of, of the actual killings taking place here. Here's another one. Einsatz group in here. Fair enough. Thank you, Army. Okay. It wasn't always, you know, it, it was more mixed up. Okay. And um, this is an interesting um, quote from Browning. The task at hand would seem daunting at first, but as time went on, the 101 battalion would refine their methods, and the shooting would become much easier to them. This scarred the men, and they tried to justify what they're doing. The quote, I made the effort it was possible for me, for, me to for me to shoot only children. It so happened that the mothers led the children by the hand. My neighbor then shot the mother, and I shot the child that belonged to her, because I reasoned with myself that after all, without its mother, the child could not live any longer. It was supposed to be so to speak, soothing my conscience to release the children unable to live without their mothers. The full weight of the statement and the significance of the word choice of a former policeman cannot be appreciated unless one knows that the German word for release also means to redeem or to save when used in a religious sense. The one who releases is the airlosser, the savior or the redeemer. So this guy was able to, um, you know, to cognitively rephrase what he was doing. Right, to think that he was he was helping these children by shooting them because they'd lost their parents, they'd lost their mother. Wow. Now, let's get into the psychological explanation. We don't have a lot of time. I could go tell you more about the Einsatz group, but I think you get the idea. These are normal guys that are called up and do this. They did suffer a lot psychologically for this. After uh, these actions, they would take the groups up and they would they would they would split them up. So they couldn't sit around and talk about it with each other. They'd split them up and reassign people and mix up the groups. And then it, it did become easier. And they'd also um, issue, at the, it, it, you know, sometimes in the middle of the day, it would become hard for people. They'd been doing this for hours. They would issue uh, rations of, of, uh, of schnapps or vodka, whatever they had, and these, you know, so these guys could drink while they are doing this so they could get through it. Now, one of the common things is, is that you, you heard at the end of the war that these guys would say, we had these horrible things. If we didn't do it, we would have been shot ourselves. And we know now that that is not true. That there, there was instances, especially with Police Battalion 101, where um, uh, the, the guy in charge, the sergeant, came out and says, we have a really tough duty. It's really hard, but we've got to do it. You know, our cities are being bombed. Think of our cities back home that are being bombed. You know, but if anybody feels like they can't do this, you know, step forward and we'll find something else for you to do. And then one guy stepped forward and then like, you know, some other junior lieutenant starts yelling at him, you know, you coward, whatever. And the captain, the SS captain, steps forward and says, leave him alone. You step forward, you go back to the barracks and you do KP duty all day, you peel potatoes, right? The rest of you guys, let's go out and shoot people. So we know that actually a lot of these guys, they didn't have to do this. They were not, they were not, it, was not, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't mean they were killed if they, if, they, if, if they could opt out. Many of them, could, if not most of them, could actually opt out of this duty. But most of them carried through with it. And okay, most of them carried through with it. And this is the question of why. Okay. So the last few minutes, let's talk a little bit about why. And you know we're gonna run out of time. Maybe we'll go a little bit over. Is that okay? Just a few um, So there there have been psychological explanations. Um, let's talk about the sort of big picture ones first. 
First one is that there is some, there was some kind of flaw in the German character. That these Germans, there's something different about them because they're German, there's a flaw in their character and they would fall, blindly follow orders and do these horrible things just because there's something about being German. There's something screwy with the Germans, right? Yeah, maybe it's their brains, maybe it's their makeup, whatever. Um, or maybe it's just something flaw in their character that's caused by their past history. And a guy named um, uh, Daniel Goldhagen wrote this book, Hitler's Willing Executioners, Ordinary Germans in the Holocaust. And in this book, he says there's a flaw in the German character. He makes the case of the flaw in the German character. And this is due to the past anti-Semitism in Europe and in Germany that leads to this sort of eliminationist anti-Semitism. And he's, this is a flaw that's not caused by genetics or something. This is a flaw caused by the past history. But it leads these Germans to be crazy and do these horrible things. And this is seen, this idea that there's somehow something flawed about these Germans and these Nazis is seen a lot in popular culture, right? You guys recognize this guy? Mm -hmm. Who is this from? Hellboy, right? Robotic German, he has no feelings, just wants to look like a killing machine. That's one depiction of Germans, right? common pop culture thing, some flaw in the character. Okay. The other flaw in the character that is commonly depicted among Germans is this. You guys know this show. Most of you are too young for this. This is, um, oops, sorry. Um, this is uh, Hogan's Heroes, right? You can now watch this. It's on TV again. Um, and this is Colonel Klink, and this is Sergeant Schultz. And these are just, the Germans are, they, they blindly follow orders and most of them are just too stupid. So they're, they're, so, they're so dumb, they just blindly follow orders of these crazy people, right? And this is the other popular depiction of the flaw, character flaw among the Germans, right? And so these are the two extremes, right? They're either robotic, you know, remorseless, emotionless killing machines or they're blindly following orders, they're idiot, idiotic blindly following orders. It's usually one of the two. And think about whatever new you know that shows Nazis, right? Generally, one of these two, right? Am I right? Very few really go into more depth or more complexity about the characters. Okay. And by the way, guess which one of these explanations the Nazi defendants at Nuremberg used? What well, what did they say? Yeah, I, I was just following orders, you know. I had to I had to kill people. Well, I just I just gotta kill people. What am I supposed to do? I had to follow orders, right? It wasn't my order, it wasn't I didn't want to do it, but I was you know, I was in the army and I just had to follow orders. Right. Now, let's talk about the psychological research. So psychological research is going to take I'm gonna give the punchline away because we're running out of time. Psychological research is gonna say you know, two things. One, it may be a flaw in the character, but it is not necessarily limited to Germans because Germans are no different than any other human beings. Just like Africans are no different or Latin Americans are different. We're all human beings. I mean, we share 98% plus of our DNA with chimpanzees. So how much do we share with each other? Quite a lot. Right? And the differences are really pretty, pretty um, superficial. Right. But there may be something about human beings, in general, that causes them to do terrible things. Okay. And the other thing is that human beings, you know, you know, a lot of a lot of the evidence, you know, is that maybe human beings do things under certain circumstances. And so we have two two really important experiments in psychology that were conducted. Um, this is one that was conducted by uh, Philip Zimbardo, who was a professor at Stanford. And this was done, I think, was it was early 70s, late 60s, early 70s at Stanford. Zimbardo was not really interested in the Holocaust. Zimbardo was interested in conditions in prisons. So what he does is he does an experiment where he takes the basement of the psychology building at Stanford, and he sets up a little mock prison. And he uh, recruits students. Um, in this case, they were male students. Recruits the students, and he randomly assigns them to either being a guard or a prisoner. Random assignment, you know, so there's no special characteristic about the prisoners that's different than the guards. Randomly assigns that the prisoners, he actually gets the Palo Alto police force to go pick up these guys at their house, go to their house and arrest them, book them in the police station, and then bring them over to the fake prison in the basement. So they have the real experience of being arrested, right? And the guards, they get trained, they're given a club, they're given these khaki uniforms, they're given these mirrored sunglasses. 
and they are told, you guys are going to be prisoners. They're not really given any training. They're told, you're the guards. And the prisoners are um, given these sort of shapeless things here. They're given a number. They're only dressed by their number. There's a guard with the mirrored sunglasses and the baton. And these guys are frisked. And, the, and they're, you know, they're, the prisoners are treated like prisoners are a lot of places. They're frisked, they're humiliated, they're locked in uh, isolation for infractions. Um, the guards have no training, they're just doing what they think they need to do to control the prisoners. Right? And long story short, what Zimbardo finds is after about a week, this experiment gets out of hand. So much so that even Zimbardo is caught up in it. Right? In other words, the guards and Zimbardo acting as the warden become obsessed with like, oh my god, the prisoners are going to get out, they're going to escape, we need to like control them. And they start doing things and they start becoming abusive. The guards start really physically abusing, you know, emotionally abusing the prisoners and it starts to escalate and get out of hand. The prisoners, some of them are suffering nervous breakdowns. This is, and this is an experiment, it becomes all too real. Right? And what happens is, is that, like on Saturday or something, Zimbardo's girlfriend, who later becomes his wife, you know, comes over and says, oh, you know, you're, she's a Stanford professor too. She says, oh, you, you done for the day? Let's go out to dinner or whatever. It's Saturday or Friday, you know, let's go out. And he's like, I can't. I gotta stay here because, you know, the prisoners may get away. And she's like, what is going on? You gotta get a grip, you know. You, know, you gotta get a grip, this is going out of hand. He's like, oh my God, and he realizes it's gone out of hand. And this is, you know, that they've all got caught up in this scenario, and he shuts the whole thing down. And he has been writing about this ever since. And what he's saying, you guys may have heard, he testified when they had the prison in Iraq and the, and the guards were doing these things to the prisoners. You guys may have seen some of that. Zimbardo was testifying. And what this is saying is that under certain circumstances, if, if you set up the structure, the circumstances, in such a way that any human being will start to act either like a a prisoner or a guard. And if they're a guard, they will start doing abusive things to people. They'll start abusing people. Okay, they'll do horrible things. Again, this is an excuse for the Nazi behavior, but it tells us something about the potential uh, human uh, violent behavior that we all have as human beings, right? Now, this is a very difficult experiment. You can't really replicate this nowadays. You get in trouble. Um, uh, I, I've been told that reality TV has replicated this, but I haven't been able to find the show where they did this. Um, but this was a very important experiment that, again, alerts us. And again, this is why, you know, they, Zimbardo was saying, you know, these, these, these army guys in Iraq, you know, really need some training, right? You can't just send them out there and tell them to be guards because they'll start flying off the handle. And this is why you train your guards and you, you know, teach you about morals and things like this. But again, if you put human beings in a certain kind of situation where there's a big power dynamic, you know, they may escalate into this kind of violent, abusive behavior. And again, here's the prisoners, they made them do push-ups. Now, the other experiment that was really interesting was done by a guy named Stanley Milgram in 1964, I believe. Um, and he was a professor at Yale who was Jewish. And he very specifically was interested in knowing why Germans would so blindly follow these orders. You know, why would these normal Germans, ordinary people, blindly follow orders? It was because they're told to do it. So he set up this very exper uh, famous experiment, the Milgram experiment. And in this experiment, there is an experimenter, there is a teacher, and there is a student. Okay? The student and the experimenter are both in on the experiment. The teacher is the guy that's actually being um, experimented on. He doesn't know this. He's told that they're, they're doing a word association study and that he, he's given a task here, and his task is to help with the experiment on this guy. But this guy and this guy are in on Does that make sense? Okay. And what they do in this experiment is. I won't show you over here. But what, what they do in this experiment is that the teacher is told to ask the, the student questions. The student's in behind a, another of the room. You can hear him, you can't see him. Behind the room. And to ask him a series of questions. And if he gets the question wrong, to give him an electric shock. And he's even taken to the room, he's, he's, he's 
feels the minor shock to he knows he thinks it's real. They bind the guy up, they see them bind the, the student up and put the shock thing on him. And he goes to the other room, they close the door, and, and he starts asking these questions. And what Milgram thought was that, you know, most people, and, and, and they had this very imposing looking machine. And it goes all the way from mild shock, medium shock, starting to get a little dangerous, get really dangerous. Oh my God, you know, triple X death skull, you know, hit this, it's fatal, you know. And Milgram said most people, he didn't think would, would, would go beyond just these initial settings, little tiny shocks, right, as they're giving the question. And of course, what's going on is the student isn't really real, right, he's not really getting shocked. But the, but the teacher doesn't know it. And so he's asking him questions that I gets it wrong, and each time he gets it wrong, he starts to go up a level and, and give him a, a greater shock. And Milgram thought that most people would just give him a couple and they would stop, right? What he found was that roughly 60, more than 65% of people, about 65% of people would give all the way the highest, you know, almost fatal dosage, 435, 450 volts. And he was really shocked by that. Most people, more than half people, will blindly follow an authority. And again, the, the experimenter's in the room, he's wearing a, a white lab coat, and the guy's shocked, he's going, hey, I'm hurting the guy, I'm, I'm a little worried. We have to just keep going because of the experiment, you need to keep progressing on, you just need to stay with the experiment. And because there was a guy in a white lab coat, an authority figure, that most people would give uh, what could be considered to be a fatal dose of electric shock. Okay. This experiment has been recreated many, many times in many different parts of the world, male, female, and the results have come out almost identically. So when you have that much triangulation of an experiment repeated this many times, it really makes us think as scientists, it really makes us think that this is really getting at something that has to do with you know, our, our human nature. That most of us, in the presence of an authority figure, will, will administer a shock to the level of you know where we might kill somebody, and if you look at this, you look at it a different way. I mean, extreme shock, you know, seventy percent. Very strong shock, eighty percent. You know, so I mean, even here, which is and this is not pleasant. You could consider this to be torture. This may be death, but you know, really, a lot of people are would do something they would consider to be torture. Okay, and so Milgram drew the conclusion. You know, again, not excusing the Nazi behavior, but in in, in certain circumstances. When you're, when, you're, when you're under obedience to an authority figure, most people will do you know, these really cruel and possibly you know, homicidal acts. Right? That's really shocking. Really, really shocking. Think about that. Now, you're probably saying, well, you know, we live in modern, the modern world and nobody would ever do this now. And of course, we're all enlightened and everything. Not so. We cannot do this experiment as psychology professors and research. This would be now considered to be unethical, right? However, who can do this experiment? Not psychologists, but reality TV producers can do this. And there was a reality TV show in England in 2009, and I have a link here. If anybody's interested, I'd be happy to send them the link. It's on YouTube. You can look it up. There was a reality TV show in England in 2009 that did a very, very close, almost exact replication of the Milgram experiment. Very close. I mean, it's very well done. They really stuck to the protocols. Originally, how it was done, they had the guy in the white lab coat. They did it very close to the original. And what do you think they found? 2009. They found almost exactly the same thing. So this really tells us. Not a, it's not like people in the 50s and 60s were more blindly obedient to authorities, and now you know everybody's like wild and free. Oh yeah, you know after the 60s we're all you know we're all, you know down with authority, whatever. No, we're all pretty much. Why do you guys think this might be the case? I ask rhetorically. Um, I personally, I, you know, I, I like evolutionary psychology a lot. We have some of the, uh, uh, the best evolutionary psychologists in the world up at UC Santa Barbara. Um, this is an area I've become more interested in. I think it provides some context for things like this. Why would primates, you know, human beings being primates, why would primates do this kind of thing? What is the, what is the use in, 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 in conforming to authority? And if we look at our closest relatives, we look at apes and we look at chimpanzees, we can see that there may be a reason why conforming to authority is really good. You, these, are, these are small societies that exist in strict dominance hierarchies, you know, with the high status alpha males, you know, and then everybody else going down. 
And if you're in that group and you, you, you buck the authority, you go against the alpha males, you are at risk of being killed or being hurt, right? And so those animals that buck the authority didn't survive to produce offspring. Those that went along with the group consensus, that went along with the high status alpha animals, probably survived and had more progeny. So by natural selection, as primates, we've been selected essentially to follow authority. Right? It, this had survival value when we were, you know, in, you know, back in the day, and that programming has persisted with us. At least, you know, if we look at the Milgram experiment as an aspect of looking at that program. And so again, you know, this tells us something about um, about human beings. You know, that we tend to go along with the group. In the past, that had survival value for us. Right? Under the Nazi regime, it may have had some survival value, but even if it didn't, we're still likely to to follow that program. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm running out of time now, so I'm going to try to wrap this up. That's Milgram. Um, by the way, people who, who were involved in the experiment, after they were, at the end of the experiment, um, you know, he came out and said, hey, look, you didn't actually kill the guy, he's really alive, you know, and, and the people were extremely relieved. Oh my God, thank God, you know, like, I'm so worried I hurt the person. And some people who were involved in the experiment later on, um, you know, said that, that this really made them think about questioning authority, right? And so people, you know, were protesting the Vietnam War, you know, and people protesting the government, and not just accepting anything that they're told by authority figures, you know, they could trace it back to either being participating in the Milgram experiment or learning about the Milgram experiment. Because again, we do have big brains, we're very smart, we can apply our rational intelligence, you know, and use it to counter whatever unconscious programming we have. So I don't mean to, I don't mean to totally bum everybody out. Okay. All right. Well, that's what I have. Um, uh, any questions? Comments? Yes. Um, I'm curious what you would think about one of the statistics that they found from uh, the Milgram experiment was when they divided up the data, they found um, when the when the testers or the or testers were told that they had to shock the patients, they were less likely to than when they were encouraged to because it was beneficial for the experiment. Yeah, yeah, there's some data like that. There's some data too, I think, on the gender. That might have come later. Yeah, there are, there are variations. There are some variations depending. And it may be, you know, if it's too overt, that people start to say, no, that's pathological. Maybe you're present, you know, maybe, I'm just speculating, maybe think people would see that, oh no, you're not really a high status authority figure, you, you're kind of posing. Because you're asking me to do something directly that, but if they're just encouraging you to do it, then people may just go ahead with it. I don't know. It's possible. I know that there, there, there have been some experiments where they've looked at the effect of gender, and there's some differences too. At least for the experimenter being a woman as opposed to man, there's some different stuff. That, but it, it's hard because we really can't do these experiments in the same way anymore. And so there have been some. My understanding is that there's been some modern attempts to do similar things, but they're not the same because we can't do them in the same way. But if you get the reality TV producers out there, they'll find some of this stuff. And I think the reality producer recreation I had, um, the guy was, my understanding, like in the original one, he was encouraging him to do it, but he was almost the level where he was telling him they had to just keep going. You know? And that's where you saw the 65%. Yes? But there is one little bit of selection involved. People had to Mm -hmm. So they already had a bias to believe yeah. that the thing was valuable. Yeah. They had a bias to think it wasn't valuable. They always said, no thanks, and we have more than Yeah, there's always, obviously some, some experimentation bias. But I will say, you know, this experiment has been done in a lot of different places and a lot of different cultures, and the results have been very similar. You know, so, yeah, you could say, well, people who volunteer, but they didn't think they were volunteering to hurt people. They were volunteering for a learning experiment. You know, they, so it was a sham experiment. Right, so, they, so yeah, there could be some experimental bias, sure. Just making the, the percentages wouldn't be quite so horrible. Well, we don't know. You know, they could be worse, you know. <laughs> they could be better or they could be worse. We don't really know, you know. And that would be an interesting experiment to do. Now, the reality TV show may be actually more of a, uh, you know, better representation because you can get almost anybody to be on TV, you know. And these guys were, were doing this to be on TV for a larger reality thing. This was just part of it. So you might have got a different 
you know, motivation or whatever, a different group of people, and the results were really similar. Yes? That, that um, book that, that talked about, like, you know, how ordinary, ordinary games are not true or not true, might have been like inherently yeah 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 no I think I think that's that's case. Now, my colleague, Dr. Baker at the university, he gives a lecture, and he is a lecture on how to raise a Nazi. He is of the firm belief that a lot of the child rearing practices in pre-Nazi Germany led to a population of people that were more likely to blindly follow orders. And he has, he has a lot of research about corporal punishment that was used and this kind of stuff. And he says this is why you got people who were very compliant to go along with authority figures, because they'd been raised in this very, um, uh, strict uh, way with lots of corporal punishment and lots of things like this. We do know now that um, corporal punishment of children seems to have some very negative effects. You know, and spanking your kids and doing worse things than spanking them, you know, can have some negative effects. There's people who disagree with this. There are a number of authors who, uh, um, who write books, you know, advocating for corporal punishment, but at least the psychological research does not support that as being a uh, a, a, a good thing, and my colleague is—he's fairly convinced that I'm not—I'm not as convinced as he is, but he's fairly convinced that this—this this is why you got people who blindly follow authority in, in Nazi Germany because the way they were raised. But my argument to that is that a lot of people in Europe at the time were raised in this way with these strict families and lots of corporal punishment, and not all of them became, you know, uh, you know, blindly following Nazi orders, you know, but. Again, you know, we're generalizing a lot. So there's lots of, remember human beings, lots of variables, right? So even if we have an underlying programming that sort of gives us a tendency to blindly follow orders, what we, what we see is that these things typically come out in very specific circumstances, right? We all have the ability to kill. We know that, you know, our primate relatives were killers and hunters, but, you know, most of us don't do any more hunting than going over to Vons and buying a steak, you know? I mean. Um, you know, but if we're in certain circumstances and that programming gets accessed, if it's useful, then you know we can access it. We have we have a real big repertoire, but it only comes out, um, you know, in certain situations. And that's one way to think. About, I, that's the way I like to think about it. I, I I wouldn't argue that it's the only way to think about it. Um, you know, you could you know, you know, I've also been trained as a Freudian psychologist. I could tell you all sorts of Freudian things that make a lot of sense. You know, when looking at this kind of stuff. But what I try to do is I try to find, for me anyway, the simplest explanation that seems to work. But, it, but you can't be overly deterministic about this stuff because human beings and historical mu movements can't be explained really by simple theories where we're looking back and saying, oh, you know, we're looking back you know, in the past and now we're explaining it from what we already know, right? On the other hand, it's very difficult to do an experiment where we predict stuff in the future. And so when we look at the Stanford Prison Experiment or the Milgram Experiment, these were at least attempts to try to predict, you know, the development of these kind of aberrant, you know, sorts of behaviors. And, you know, we don't have much like that. We don't have, you know, again, because of ethical concerns, which is a good thing, um, you know, we don't have a lot of experiments like that will predict into the future. And a lot of the evolutionary psychologists get criticized because they're, they're doing these, you know, uh, explanations into the past. From what they know in the future, and that is a, that's a valid scientific um, criticism. I think we have to be a little careful about that. So I don't want to be too over deterministic about this. Let me present this to you all. What I'm telling you as some speculations about these things. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's very interesting. So there are um, there are some theologians. Um, who say, you know, we shouldn't even study people like Hitler because really he's just a manifestation of evil and that's it and nothing you're going to, by studying him, you're validating him. Right? By studying Hitler, trying to explain why he was the way he was, you're validating, you know, evil, right? When we look back in agricultural times and pre-modern times when the hail came and destroyed all the crops, you know, that was a manifestation of evil and it was evil so we just got to accept it and we're going to starve to death because it was just an evil thing that happened. 
you know, as a scientist, I got to say, no, no, let's find out why the hail falls from the sky. How does it form? Can we predict if it's going to happen? Can we protect our crops? Can we prevent it in any way, shape, or form? And that's what we do as scientists. You know, that's our job. So to say it's just evil and we can't really look at it, you know, doesn't really help us. Anymore. You know, it, 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 and I'm the firm believer that understanding something, you know, understanding Hitler does not validate Hitler. Understanding a pathological condition does not validate. But I, I do understand, and there are there are religious people who, especially religious people who, who feel the opposite of that. Yeah. As a psychologist, as somebody you know who's trained as a scientist, you know, I, I, my worldview is different. Than that. You know, what does evil mean, right? Buddhists describe evil as ignorance. You know, there's lots of different definitions of evil, right? What is it? It's doing bad things. Where do you draw the line? What do you gradiate it? This is really, really super evil, and this is slightly evil. You know, I cheated on my taxes a little bit, you know, I have to pay extra deduction. Slightly evil, or, you know, where do, where, where do we draw the line in the sand between what's evil and what isn't? Again, as a psychologist, you know, I want to understand, you know, what these things are. Again, it doesn't, it doesn't negate, you know, the religion, or it's not saying a bad thing about a religious belief in evil or anything. But, you know, my worldview is that, you know, we, I just want to understand it. Because if we can understand it, we can try to prevent it. And certainly, um, I give a lecture on genocide. And genocide is one of these things that people now, you know, very evil stuff, you know. And genocide happens all the time. It's happened quite a bit in human, human history. Um, and it, it continues to happen. And yet, because we've studied genocide, we now know that there are, are stages in its development. And there are stages where it can be interrupted. And because we know that now, we have a much better chance of preventing it. If we didn't study it, we just said it's evil, people are just periodically evil, we wouldn't be able to, to stop it. Does that make sense? Yes? When you were talking about how um, the Nazis weren't literally forced to kill people they chose to, do you think it was a stronger driving factor to be accepted by their like, uh, social group or to... Yeah, I mean, I mean, one thing you think of is peer pressure. Now, one of the things these police battalion guys were not Nazis. They were not Nazi party members. They were, again, regular guys. They weren't ideologically committed to Nazism. They weren't especially anti-Semitic. You know, but they were told, this is what you have to do. And you know, there's like this peer pressure to go along with what everybody's doing. And you know, they were told there's a duty, and we need to do this for Germany, and you know, preserve, you know, our, our, our towns and homes are being bombed, and these people are somehow responsible for it. And, you know, the, 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 the people in authority were, were, were trying to convince them that this was a necessary thing. And I think, you know, it, in some ways, you know, it, 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 it could go along with the peer pressure, right? And it'd be a lousy situation, you know? And, and those people who refused to do it, that must have, in some ways, that must have taken some real, um, you know, courage. You know, all these Nazis around, and they're, they look kind of like, you know, they're really in charge. You're going to go back against them and do something that makes you look like a coward in front of your fellow guys. But, yes? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good, it's a, it's a good question, and there's a lot of there's a lot of answers to this. Okay, um, the one that you know that I tend to look at is that well, Germany that had undergone uh, a you know some sort of national uh, resistance. Like, what was the question? Oh, uh, the question was why did certain people in some co countries resist the Germans, and other people like in Germany there wasn't much resistance. Okay, that's the question. And I would say that in Germany, you know, the Germans, you know, had a, a, a national narcissistic wounding, you know, after World War I. You know, and, they, and again, the Nazis capitalized on this, you know, and so we're able, I mean, once they were able to get in power, they were really able to consolidate that. Right? And, they, and, they, and they used a lot of propaganda, brilliant propaganda, you know, Goebbels was brilliant propaganda. The other countries didn't have that same background, and so people were, you know, it wasn't like this slow thing with propaganda. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna make you feel good about yourself and your country again. Just go along with us. You know, it was just like one day they were living in their country, and the next day the Nazis come in and invade. It's like, oh well, screw that. You know, we're gonna fight against them. And so part of it was they didn't have the same, the same, um, you know, in a way preparation. Now you could also say that there's differences in national character. You know, you look at the Italians who were who were committed fascists versus the Germans. You know, well the Germans. You know, they also, part of Nazism was this racial ideology. 
You know, the Italians were fascists, you know, big time fascists, but they weren't especially racist. Mm -hmm. right? And the Germans had this racial ideology that went along with it. And this was something that, and, and they were very smart. You, know, you want to convince somebody and, and get them indoctrinated into an ideology, you start with the little kids. And they started very early, and they co opted the schools and the education system, and, you know, all the way from kindergarten all the way through college and, you know, postgraduate school. And, you know, many academic professions, you know, they, they, they really fell off and encouraged anybody who was, who was different. They, they did it in very, I mean, I, I mean, it was evil, you know, these were evil, it was evil, but it was very smart. Looking. I have a whole other lecture on the, on the education system in Dodge. But, but it's interesting to compare and contrast the reactions of the different populations in different countries, some of which the general dirty work for them, others which Yeah, yeah. Well, the other thing is. Well, the French, the French are really interesting, and they are really a little bit, in my mind, a little bit um, of an enigma. But I will tell you that the government in France at the time when the Germans invaded France and took it over, the government was very split, and you had a lot of right-wing people in the government who were who were who were if not sympathetic. You know, they were ideologically more aligned with Nazism, and so. Part of France, you know, there was, France had a lot of, you know, right-wing people in power, a little bit, you know, more perhaps accepting of, of the Nazis. So France is very interesting. Other places, you know, you, you, you have the Nazis come in and suddenly invade, you know, you're gonna, you know, that's, that's, that's very shocking. On the East, as things in the East become more brutal, also the Nazis in France, you know, were not nearly as brutal as they were in Poland or in, in Lithuania and Ukraine. They come in and start just mass shooting people. You know, people have nothing to lose in my own You know, you shot my whole family, you know, threw them in a ditch. I'm gonna go out and go to the Russians and beg for some guns and go and kill me some Nazis. You know, and you had that going on in the East. And so again, these things are more brutal. But the other thing that's interesting that happens is it's more brutal in the East, but after the Germans have the experience of brutality in the East, and then they come back and they go to different fronts or they return back home and they're assigned to positions in the West, they bring that brutality back with them. And so things become more brutal in the West later on, and of course they have more partisan resistance. But so that's a very interesting question. Yeah, we could put that question to Dr. Bushman if you were He'd probably give you a more interesting, in-depth answer than I could give you. A very good question. And why did some people send their Jews in the trains? And some the Italians really didn't. I mean, you know, we don't care the Jewish people. We don't care. You know, the French, and a lot of Jews, right? Why? Jews were really assimilated, you know? I mean, really, maybe even more than Germany, you know, yet, you know, the Vichy government sent them, sent them away, you know? Very, very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Yes? What do you think the effect would have been if they had the kind of social networking that we have now, the kind of technology, you know, the ability to communicate? Yeah, very interesting. Well, who who who's it made the statement? I always think it's Einstein, but it probably isn't. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, if things if people knew what was going on, I mean, a lot of the stuff the Nazis wanted to keep it secret. Why were the killing camps in uh, in Poland? Because you know the Germans, the regular German people back in Germany didn't know what's going on. They had to stop the T4 program because the Allies dropped leaflets saying what was going on, and then Bishop Galen, you know goes and, and publicly says, you know, this is wrong, we shouldn't be, you know, how should the government do this? And the, and the Nazi government has to bow to public pressure and stop it, or at least stop it for a while, the T4 program, right? And then it starts up a little bit later on, but then they stop it for a while, right? So yeah, you know, I mean, if, if maybe if this were out and people knew what was going on, that's a good thing. I like to think of social, social networks as, as having a potential for, for, for doing good things, for bringing things out. On the other hand, you know, I'm sure somebody else would come in and argue that they just cause people to become more polarized. You know, I mean, I've got friends on Facebook, and you know, half of them are liberals and half of them are in the Tea Party, and you know, basically, you know, what it is, it's just people become you just see people become more polarized. I've, I've never seen anybody on Facebook read a Facebook post and change their political orientation because of something they read on Facebook. And if you've seen that, let me know because I, I want to believe that that actually happens, but. Um, I haven't seen, or people compromise. I haven't seen that either. So, yeah, I, I'd like to believe that it's a good thing, but I, I want to see some proof. I, I, you know, I bet people are researching that right now. That's a hot area for research in psychology. Yeah. 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 Ye
which is going to be very interesting. So they wanted to do a cool doctoral dissertation. That's a cool thing. Any other questions? Oh, great. You guys have been a great, yeah. Um, this is more on folks on Hitler, so a little off topic, but I'm curious. Um, since Hitler wasn't uh, the, the typical idea of what he thought the perfect area yeah. should be, yeah. why do you think he made that idea of the long term blue line? Yeah, so I have a whole lecture on this, um, on racial classifications in Nazi Germany. So there's a whole, I have a whole, like, three hour lecture on this. It was quite interesting. Um, so there's a, there was a joke at the time. Um, that, you know, and there's lots of jokes in Nazi Germany, like little subtle jokes. You get in trouble for telling jokes. And there's a whole book on this, actually. The jokes have become like this kind of macabre humor that Germany would say. So the, one of the jokes was that you would be, uh, you'd be blonde like Hitler, um, uh, what was it, blonde like Hitler, thin like uh, Goering, and uh, tall like Goebbels. Because, <laughs> you know, Hitler was, you know, dark, and, um, you know, Goering was uh, huge and fat, and Goebbels was short. And so, you know, none of them were the Aryan ideal. None of these top Nazi guys were the Aryan ideal. Of course, you saw the picture of him where they did not fit the idea. But the rationale was this, is that, you know, that, that, that German blood, air pure Aryan blood has been tainted by generations of influencing mostly from Jews and other undesirable peoples. And, you know, what we're doing is we're on a program now, if, if we're not perfect, we're in a program now to, uh, to, to make things better in the future. You know, that would be your, your more enlightened German statement. Your less enlightened would be that, well, you know, I'm Hitler. I, I, yeah, I'm a little darker, but I still am, you know, pure area. You know? And, maybe, and maybe what applies to, you know, you does not necessarily apply to me because I'm in the power and I've got the gun and you don't. Right? And, of course, you have to realize that all this racial stuff that the Nazis made up was purely fantasy. You know, this was a fantasy. I mean, racial stuff is, is, is essentially fantasy anyway. I mean, racial differences, you know, are... Are, are, are really minute, you know, skin color, eye color, you know, some some physiological things. But you know, take a look at us. I mean, we we're different. We we have lots of different, you know, whatever that small one percent of genetics is different. We've got some variability in that. We don't, you know, we don't look the same, you know, different heights and different things. So racial stuff is mostly a social construct, and it usually has been a construct that is useful for the people in power to maintain their hegemony. You guys know that word hegemony? Mm -hmm. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly now. Finally. <laughs> it's not hegemony, or some people say hegemony, maybe the English say hegemony, but hegemony, right? I maintain the status quo where I'm in power, and this is a, re this is a nice rationalization for them. You know, yes, you know, we British, we're in power, that's why we, you know, it, it's really okay for us to colonize all these people and take over all these places and steal all their stuff, because, you know, we're just doing them a favor because they couldn't do it for themselves. They were little brown people, you know, and they can't really do that, right? Excellent book, highly recommended by Jared Diamond. And he talks about, um, I'm trying to the title of it, he talks about um, how really the reason that why like, certain people have hegemony over other people has nothing to do with race. It has to do with the fact that they were able to grow certain kinds of grains. Guns, germs, and, guns, and, germs, and, and steel. Yeah. It's a really good book. They're able to grow certain kinds of grains and therefore store food, which freed up people in that society to then develop weapons and better weapons. And so you're able to develop better weapons. You're able to go and subjugate other people. It has nothing to do with your race. It has to do with your geography. Right? So if you're in America and you have vast plains of wheat, you can have lots of surplus food and lots of people can spend full time developing atomic weapons and better guns and things like that. If you're in a place like, you know, some little island, you know, Palau, you know, you don't have a lot of, you know, uh, excess food. You have to go out and hunt and gather all the time, fish. You know, you can't store stuff and people can't specialize in weapons development. There may not be metal in the ground, whatever. That's the reason why some people have dominance over other people. It's nothing to do with their race. You know, I mean, if Africans had lived in a place where there was lots of wheat and cat, also uh, animals too. You know, they were able to do animal husbandry. You know, maybe they would have had the British Empire rather than the British having it. You know, great book. I highly recommend Jerry Diamond, great author. Third Chimpanzee is also another good book. Yeah, really recommend. It. Good. You guys are a great audience. Thank you. Really good questions. Really appreciate it. Um, getting late. We should probably end. So let me thank you all for coming. I really appreciate you being here and listening to me. And again, if you're ever at Channel Islands and you want to come by and sit in on, on uh, you know, a lecture on the Nazi Germany class, feel free to come in. Usually we're in the big classroom. So, um, you know, always a seat or two. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you.